Praise God again for the powerful music we've experienced today. Well, last Sunday morning, uh, we launched a new preaching series entitled Faith and Doubt. And our aim in these messages is to properly understand the relationship between faith and doubt and the role that faith and doubt play in our lives and in our walk with God. And so last week, as we uh, kicked off the series and began this conversation, I started by sharing part of my own story with you. Uh, when I was 16 years old and a rising junior in high school, I was at a point in life where I was questioning everything that I've been taught to believe. And this included the truthfulness of Christianity. While I wanted the Christian story to be true and longed for the Christian story to be true, and the depth of who I was at that time, I just wasn't convinced. Well, around the same time, I was invited by some friends to attend this three-day spiritual retreat. And so I went to this retreat, not really sure what to expect. And on the first night, all of us students were led into this large room. As I mentioned last week, the lights were off. Uh, there were candles all over the place that were lit. And there was a cross in the center of the room. And we all sat down. And we were given a pen and a piece of paper. And when the preacher began to talk, it was as if there was nobody else there. And he was only talking to me that the message, it seemed, was aimed toward me. He said, there is something that is holding you back from experiencing life with God. There is something that is stopping you from entering into a relationship with God. Whatever that thing is, I want you to take your pen and piece of paper and write it down. And without even thinking, I jotted down the word that came to mind. Doubt. D-O-U-B-T. And then I folded up my piece of paper because I was ashamed. I really was convinced that I was the only person who struggled with doubt. And then what happened later that evening, we were invited to take what we had written down and to nail it to the cross in the center of that room. There were hammers, there were nails, and so I got up, I knelt down, and with tears in my eyes and my heart beating fast and a lump in my throat, I just nailed down that word doubt. I gave my doubt over to God. And all I can really say is that inspired a change in me. In fact, by the time I left that retreat just a few days later, I felt transformed. I had this newfound purpose, this newfound energy, this eagerness. I wanted nothing more than to serve God, to read scripture, to pray, to tell other people about Jesus. And that was the beginning of what would eventually become, just a few months later, a call to pastoral ministry. I became convinced that God wanted me to give my life and uh, service of others by being a pastor. Well, what I didn't mention last time that I want to mention this morning is that call that I received as a 16-year-old to become a pastor uh, brought me to college just a couple of years later where I majored in religion. It just made sense to me. Okay, I'm going to go to seminary after college. I should major in religion. I signed up for as many Bible and theology classes as I could. I was eager to learn. And I'm going to be honest, initially, that experience unsettled me. I was excited, but it actually ended up unsettling me because what it did is it began to pick apart the more simplistic faith I had when I was in high school. Those of you who have ever taken a Bible class in college know that studying the Bible in college is not exactly the same thing as studying the Bible in Sunday school or in youth group. Yeah, the Bible's inspired, but you're also looking at Scripture in a more academic way, and you're wrestling with some of the complexity of Scripture. And so what happened was I began to engage in this process that philosophers call deconstruction. You ever heard that before? That's the $50 word for the sermon, deconstruction. I was deconstructing my faith and deconstructing my beliefs and what I held to be true, and that was unnerving because from there, all these doubts and these questions began to reemerge, and I was under the impression that I had put all that stuff behind me when I was in high school, that I was done with the doubting, I was done with the questions. But then later, with the help of pastors and professors and mentors who were patient with me, who took time out of their schedule to sit down with me, have coffee with me, and talk with me, those doubts and those questions actually brought me in the end to a faith that was richer and deeper and meatier, more substantive than the more simplistic faith I had as a high school student. I was beginning to develop a faith that could withstand critical thinking. Tough questions. I share all this to say that, folks, so often doubt can be beneficial. Doubt can be beneficial. 
Doubt pushes us to study and learn and grow. It humbles us. It causes us to go back and re-examine overly simplistic beliefs that we need to re-examine. Not only that, but doubt also helps us be more compassionate and empathetic toward fellow doubters and those who may see things differently. But like anything else, doubt also has a shadow side. You see, like milk that's been left out too long, doubt can spoil and doubt can go bad. And that's what I want to focus on in this sermon as we continue on through this series. What happens when doubt goes bad? Uh, for this sermon, I've drawn on a book uh, by Pastor John Ortberg. And you've heard me mention his name before. He's one of my favorite preachers and writers. He lives out in California. Um, he wrote this book a while ago entitled No Doubt. Not no N O, but instead K N O W. No doubt, just two words. Well, in that book, No Doubt, that Orberg wrote, in one of the chapters, he identifies three types of bad doubt, which I want to explore in this sermon. You remember how last week, uh, the special number for the sermon was five, five observations about faith and doubt? Well, today, the special number is three, three types of bad doubt that we're going to examine. And so the first type of bad doubt that Orberg lifts up in that book is what's known as skepticism. Can you say that word with me? Skepticism. Now, what exactly is a skeptic? Here's a good definition of skepticism or a skeptic. A skeptic is someone who holds off on believing. A skeptic might say, I don't want to decide yet. I'm not ready to commit to God. I'm not ready to take a leap of faith because I don't have enough evidence to convince me or persuade me. Now, folks, at first glance, this approach seems reasonable, doesn't it? After all, none of us want to be easily duped. None of us want to be fooled. None of us want to be gullible. We all want to think of ourselves as intelligent and smart and rational. But beneath the surface, here's what a skeptic is actually thinking. If I believe, if I trust, then I might be wrong. And I don't want to be wrong. I would rather appear right than take the risk of being wrong. Uh, there's a story about this kind of skepticism, and I'll warn us, <laughs> it's kind of a grim and morbid story, okay? But there's a story about this kind of skepticism that took place uh, during the French Revolution. Remember learning about the French Revolution when you were in school? Um, this was during what was called the Reign of Terror, when people were being executed all over the place. Well, there were three men awaiting execution. And the first man was a priest. And so they brought the priest forward, and they asked this priest, do you have any last words? And with great confidence, the priest said, yes, I believe that God's going to save me. So they put his head in the guillotine. They released the blade. The blade stopped just two inches from his neck. And everybody in the crowd said, it's a miracle. God has rescued this man. God has answered his prayer. And they let him go. And so the second man came up. He, too, was a priest, and they asked the priest, do you have any last words? Yes, just like my colleague, I believe that God's going to save me. So they put his head in place, released the blade. What happened? The blade stopped two inches from his neck. And once again, everybody said, it's a miracle. God has stepped in. God has done something, and they let him go. Well, the third man came forward. He was not a priest. He was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He was a skeptic, and he wanted to distance himself from these other men who so easily trusted God, because come on, what if they're wrong? He didn't want to be wrong. And so they asked the skeptic, do you have any last words? And he looked at the guillotine, and he said, yeah, I see what the problem is. There's something jammed up there in the gear mechanism. <laughs> What's the point of that bizarre story you're probably asking yourself? Here's the point. Skeptics are people who even at their own expense would rather look right than trust and risk being wrong. A notable example of skepticism in the Bible uh, would be Thomas. Remember Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus? Uh, now, of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only John provides significant insights into Thomas's character. We learn more about Thomas than we do the other three Gospels. Uh, we learn more about Thomas and John than we do the other three Gospels, I should say. 
And so the first time that the disciple Thomas speaks in John uh, occurs more than halfway through in John 11. And so to set the context, and you're probably familiar with the story, in John 11, Jesus finds out that his really good friend has died. What was his name? Lazarus. And so what Jesus wants to do, he wants to go and be with Lazarus and be with his sisters, Mary and Martha, the rest of the family. The problem is that Lazarus is from a town and an area where previously the religious leaders had tried to kill Jesus. And so understandably, the disciples, the 12 disciples, they don't want Jesus to go back to this community, this area, because, oh my goodness, what if they kill Jesus? And, oh my goodness, what if they kill us too? I don't want to die. And so they try to talk him out of it, and they try to dissuade him, but Jesus is adamant, no, I want to go see Lazarus. Here's how Thomas responds. This is from John 11, uh, verse 16, up here on the screen. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. Now, when you read commentary on this passage, some interpreters read these words from Thomas as a rallying cry. Let's go too and die with Jesus. I don't see it that way. Based on the context and what we know about Thomas from other parts of this gospel, because again, John offers more insights into Thomas than the other gospel writers. Based on all that, I think that Thomas is being sarcastic. He's not saying, let's go too and die with Jesus. No, he's saying, all right, let's go too. Kind of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. Let's go too and die with Jesus. However, the depth of Thomas' skepticism is not found in this passage. It's not even found in John 14, another time that Thomas speaks. Instead, the depth of his skepticism occurs just after the resurrection of Jesus in John chapter 20. This is the story of Thomas that you're probably familiar with. So Jesus is raised on Easter Sunday, and he makes all these appearances, and and one of the appearances involves the disciples. Uh, Jesus comes to the disciples, but for whatever reason, Thomas isn't there. We don't know where Thomas is. Maybe he's running an errand. Maybe he's getting dinner. Or maybe he's still discouraged by the crucifixion. Thomas is not there with the other disciples. And so these disciples come to Thomas later, and they say, Thomas, you'll never believe what happened, but the resurrected Jesus has come to us. Now, Thomas has good reason to trust what these disciples are saying. Remember, he's been with Jesus for three years. He's heard Jesus talk about the resurrection. He's heard Jesus talk extensively about the resurrection. He also knows he's got 10 people over here, 10 disciples. There would have been 11, but minus Judas. He's got 10 people over here all saying the same thing. And these are people of integrity and character. They're not going to lie and make this up. Thomas, however, chooses a skeptic's path. This is from John 20, verses 24 through 25. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless, somebody say unless. Unless. I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Here's what should interest us about Thomas as common. Now the other disciples, they've seen the resurrected Jesus. Remember they said to him, we have seen the Lord. Thomas, however, isn't just content with seeing Jesus, what else does he want to do? I've got to touch him. I've got to place my hand and the wound in his side, because remember, Jesus was pierced in his side. In other words, Thomas wants more proof and more evidence than what those other disciples experienced. Because of all that over the years, uh, we in the church, we as Christians have given a nickname to Thomas, What's the nickname that we call him? Doubting Doubting Thomas. But interesting enough, the name Doubting Thomas does not show up in the Bible. You will not find the name Doubting Thomas anywhere in Scripture. I'm not sure where it came from, but at some point we started calling him that. However, the Gospel writer John does give Thomas another nickname. Listen again. This is from John 11, or I'm sorry, John 20, uh, verse 24, although John 11 also mentions this. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Now, here's what we need to recognize. 
more than any other gospel writer, and this is the reason that John is my favorite gospel writer, more than any other gospel writer, John writes like a poet. There is so much depth in John. There is metaphor. There is figurative language. So when John calls Thomas the twin, he's not necessarily saying that Thomas has a literal twin sibling. Right? I have children, and they're twins, Hannah and Noah. So Noah has a twin sister. Hannah has a twin brother. He's not saying that. What he means is Thomas is a person of two minds. And these two minds could not be more different. In fact, when I think of this, I, I, I think of the movie that uh, came out back in the 1980s, uh, Twins, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. You all ever seen this? Are Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito similar? I mean, they're both male. That's about it. I mean, these guys could not be more different. Right? One's tall, one's not so tall, and et cetera, et cetera. Thomas's two minds could not be more different. They're polar opposite. There's a part of Thomas that wants to believe. There's a part of Thomas that wants to trust. There's a part of Thomas that wants to have faith. But there's another part over here that's afraid of being wrong. And that's the part that says, I need to see Jesus. And oh, by the way, I've also got to touch him. Now, folks, the beautiful thing is when we read this story is that Jesus meets Thomas in his skepticism, doesn't he? And from that encounter, Jesus offers grace and compassion and understanding. But this doesn't mean that skepticism is good. Skepticism is not good. Skepticism keeps you and me trapped in these two minds. And it stops us from committing to Jesus, giving our life to Jesus. But folks, there is a type of doubt that's even worse than skepticism. The second type of doubt that John Ortberg identifies in that book that we're going to talk about, and that would be cynicism. Say this with me, cynicism. The first is skepticism, the second is cynicism. While skeptics demand evidence and look for answers, cynics offer conclusions conclusions that are almost always negative. I'm going to be honest with you, which you would expect from your preacher, right? <laughs> of all the types of doubt that we're talking about, cynicism is the one that I tend to struggle with. Right? There have been times and seasons and moments when I've succumbed to cynicism. I'm sure we've all been there before. It's hard not to succumb to cynicism because life can leave us feeling jaded, can it? But I've also been around other people who have succumbed to cynicism. And let me tell you something. It is exhausting. It is so exhausting to be around. Amen? In fact, I remember some years ago, and this wasn't Asbury. This was somewhere else. I was serving a church. And we were at a staff meeting. And we had this area of ministry at the church that was growing and thriving and flourishing and doing well. The problem was, the person who led that area of ministry, the volunteer, he needed to step down because he was moving to a different part of the country. So we needed somebody else who could lead that area of ministry into the future. But everybody that we asked said no. They said they didn't have the time or they were too busy or they didn't feel that their gifts were in the right place. And so we were struggling. What are we going to do? So we're at the staff meeting and we're trying to brainstorm and, and talk about the solutions. And I just said, well, Here's an idea. Why don't we put the need in the bulletin for Sunday morning? Because people read the bulletin, don't they? Let's put the need in the bulletin, and let's see who responds. Well, there was this staff member who said, we could do that, Chris, but I'll tell you right now, nobody's going to respond. Nobody's going to say yes. Nobody's interested in doing this. And I pushed back, and I said, really? This was a large church. I said, in a church of hundreds and hundreds of people, you don't think at least one person is going to say that they're interested? No, he said, I don't. He was insistent. Well, we went ahead and we put that in the bulletin. And sure enough, a few people responded. Not a lot, but maybe three or four people. So then it came time to selecting one person of those three or four people, prayerfully thinking that through. Let me ask you this. Do you think that that staff member was favorable toward any of those options? No. Imagine that. He said, listen, they're all nice people, they're all committed Christians, they're good church folk, but you know what? They don't have the gifting, they don't have the skill set. It would be better if we just did away with that area of ministry. 
despite the fact that it was still growing and thriving. You see, folks, cynics jump to a negative conclusion, assuming that their negative conclusion is the only outlook worth having. A notable example of cynicism in Scripture is Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the person, he was the Roman governor of Judea, who ultimately authorized the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday. Well, right before Pilate had Jesus crucified, in the Gospel of John, uh, John says that Pilate is interviewing Jesus, and he's having a conversation with him. And in the midst of this conversation, Jesus and Pilate, one-on-one, they're discussing the concept of truth. And here's what Pilate says in that conversation. What is truth, retorted Pilate. Make no mistake about it, Pilate's not being sincere. He's not being genuine with this question. He's essentially concluding that there is no way to get to the truth. Even though, ironically, truth is standing right there in front of him. In a body. The way, the truth, and the life in the person of Jesus Christ. Cynics jump to a negative conclusion because it is so much easier than having faith. You know why? Faith requires risk, doesn't it? It requires trust. It calls us to get up and to do something, to act. Meanwhile, cynics would prefer to sit back and do absolutely nothing. Going back to Pilate, how did Pilate try to handle the crucifixion of Jesus? He tried not to do anything He tried not to act. Instead, he asked for a bowl of water, and he said, I wash my hands of this man's death, which is his way of symbolically avoiding responsibility. And that's what cynics do. Cynics try to avoid responsibility. They try to dodge the big questions of life, the questions that keep us awake at night. Like, is there a God? Does God love me? Does God care about me? Is God invested in me? Does God want a personal relationship with me because the answers would actually compel them to do something? And they would prefer to do nothing. You still with me? All right, even if you're not, just not anyway. (laughs) Skepticism, cynicism. But there is a type of doubt that's even worse than all that. The worst type of doubt there is, rebellion. Rebellion is better known as defiant or stubborn unbelief. Let's be clear. It's not that a rebel doesn't believe. It's that a rebel doesn't want to believe because by believing, it means that they would have to surrender their entire life, their whole existence over to God. In fact, C.S. Lewis, the great 20th century lay theologian, C.S. Lewis says that before his conversion to Christianity, uh, he was a committed atheist. He was a devout atheist. And atheism during that period wasn't just his outlook or his perspective. It was his deepest desire. Lewis says he longed for atheism to be true. You know why? Because it meant that his life would be off limits to God. Here's what C.S. Lewis said In his 1955 book, Surprised by Joy, uh, he wrote this book shortly after his wife had died. No word in my vocabulary expressed deeper hatred than the word interference. But Christianity placed at the center what then seemed to me a transcendental interferer. Talking there about God. If its picture were true, in other words, if the picture of Christianity were true, then no sort of treaty with reality could ever be possible. There was no region even in the innermost depth of one's soul, nay, their least of all, which one could surround with a barbed wire fence and guard with a notice. No admittance. No admission. And that was what I wanted. Some area, however small, to which I could say to all other beings, including God, this is my business and mine only. Back off, God. C.S. Lewis is saying in a nutshell, I didn't want Christianity to be true because if Christianity were true, every single part of my soul would have to surrender to God's authority. I didn't want that. That's why elsewhere he said this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. 
If it's false, it has no importance at all. We're wasting our time. If true, of infinite importance, the only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Rebels are not naive. They're smart people. They understand that if the Christian faith is true, that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, it has profound and radical implications for our lives. So rather than believing, rebels dig their heels in the ground and they say, I refuse to believe. I refuse to trust. By far the strongest example of rebellion in the Bible is Pharaoh. Uh, we talked about Pharaoh a little bit last week uh, in the book of Exodus, um, in the Old Testament. Uh, the people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt. Uh, they're suffering under the yoke of the monarch, Pharaoh, and they cry out to God for deliverance, and God responds by sending Moses, and Moses goes to Pharaoh, and Moses says to Pharaoh, let God's people go. Uh, God says, let my people go. Now, what does Pharaoh say in response? Uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. And so, what did God do next? Well, God sent a series of plagues upon the nation of Egypt. How many plagues did God send? Ten. The big number in the book of Exodus is ten, right? Ten commandments, ten plagues. So God sends ten plagues. For example, God turned the waters of the Nile into blood. He, um, there was the locust, and there was the death of the firstborn. But the second plague involved frogs. I mean, folks, frogs were everywhere. Anybody like frogs? Frogs were everywhere, up to the wazoo, frogs up to your eyeballs. You could not move without being encountered by frogs, and, and Pharaoh couldn't take it anymore. So he summoned Moses, and he summoned Moses' brother Aaron to do something. This is how the conversation unfolded. Exodus chapter 8. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged, plead with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. You set the time, Moses replied. He put the ball in Pharaoh's court. Tell me, when do you want me to pray for you, your officials, and your people? Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile River. Do it tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Somebody say, huh? Put yourself in this story. Moses comes to you and says, you set the time. What are you going to say? Do it right now. Do it immediately. This is how stubborn Pharaoh is. This is how defiant Pharaoh is. Pharaoh would rather have his country suffer another day, have the crops suffer, have diseases rampant, um, have the economy suffer than to submit to God's authority any sooner. And sadly, there are people like this when it comes to God. They refuse to believe, refuse to trust, despite all the evidence that they might find for Christianity. They resist the power of Pentecost, the Spirit's work in their life. Skepticism, cynicism, and rebellion are all forms of bad doubt. But I want to emphasize what we said earlier. Doubt doesn't have to spoil. Doubt doesn't have to go bad. In fact, properly approached, doubt can lead us to the truth. As we wrap up the sermon, I end with these words from Frederick Buechner. He says, doubts are the ants and the pants of faith. Don't you love that? Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. And so my prayer for all of us today and as we go throughout the sermon series is that our faith would be awakened and stirred to new levels of depth. And this won't happen by ignoring doubt or avoiding the big questions. Instead, it'll happen by tackling these things head on so that in turn, we might be led closer and closer to the truth who is Jesus Christ the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. God, thank you that in Jesus Christ you have come for us all. And yes, we wrestle with doubt, and yeah, we wrestle with the hard questions. But help our doubt not sour and go bad. Help us to resist cynicism and skepticism and rebellion, and to surrender our doubt to you, God. 
as you continue to reveal your ways and your purposes to us, your deep desire for us to be in relationship with you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.